Hmm. So, your inner perfectionist is preventing you from getting started painting your miniatures. Well, I should be able to help. Recently I saw a Reddit post all about someone whose friend has trouble actually picking up a brush and painting because they worry they might not compare to some of the wonderful artists out there. So instead of being inspired, they've become daunted by the idea that they might mess up a model. And you know what? I totally get it. These silly bits of plastic are at least $4 a model off the shelf and never with any to spare. 3D printing has it a little bit easier since you can always reprint the model if you're not happy with it. But that doesn't mean there isn't a mental cost to not getting things exactly how you want them. And though we can churn another model out, does it mean we still want to paint it if we couldn't get it right the first time? We all know that without the practice, we'll never get there. And while I thank you all so very much for watching my videos, me, and others can only get you so far until you actually have to touch brush to a model. So now we have our problem. We don't want to paint because we feel like we'll ruin the model, but we can't practice unless we paint. So I've come up with three ways to practice some techniques from advanced to simple that no one will ever, ever, ever have to know about. A lot of painters I see comment that they have an airbrush, but only use it for priming. But priming is actually a really good time to practice some of the finer airbrush techniques where it's never going to matter if you get them wrong, because the final product is always just a primed model. I start this one by giving it a dust layer. So this is my priming for my priming as it were, which you can find out more about in the link up here. The big three things to master for airbrush detail is learning how to thin paint for an airbrush, and how to control airflow and paint flow to prevent spidering or hit certain parts and angles. To practice thinning, we can easily do that in the cup of an airbrush. Add a few drops of the primer, then a drop of water. Mix and spray. If it feels like it's having a hard time coming out, add another drop of water. Percolate just a tiny bit to get the paint to flow back into the cup. Make sure the cup's uncovered for that. Clean the needle, then mix again. Keep doing that until you can get a steady flow of paint when the trigger stays held and only slightly pulled back. To check the consistency we've arrived at, just pull some out with a brush and have a look on a clean white palette on just how thin the paint is. Then there are the dual action functions. To practice airflow, what we can do is spray the model like we normally would when airbrush priming, but while it's still wet, help it dry with a bit of gentle air from the airbrush. While the paint's wet, there's a possibility of moving it around if we give it too much air. So the goal is to have a constant stream of air going on the primer, but gentle enough that it doesn't move the paint when up close. This way, we know what the right pressure will be to prevent spidering when doing normal airbrush detailing. For the second of our dual action functions, we can work on paint flow just by picking out small details around the model and seeing how we can target them in relation to the unprimed areas. So let's start with a hand and see if we can get the top of the knuckles only. Getting just the right angle and, oop, too much, oh well, now it's just primed. Trying the other knuckles, taking it just a bit slower, and there we go. We've got a good angle and flow just right. Oops, now it's primed too. And when we're done with all the spraying, no one will ever know just how much this little guy trained our muscle memory to help with the airbrush. While layering and light angles are a bit of an advanced thing, there's a way we can practice in secret as part of a standard shade, base, and highlight. So this is good if you want to advance yourself, but don't want to ruin the unified look of an army or a unit. The idea is a simple one, and that's just to draw shapes with your base coat color over the areas that base coat is going to be, keeping in mind a light source. We're not worried about blending here at all, but just getting the shapes and angles right. We don't even care about opacity, since we're the only ones going to see this. It's for our mind's eye to process, not anyone else's. For rounded shapes, like his muscles, we practice with ovals and circles. 
finding the brightest point and making it wider and wider until it looks like it's filled in, but pointing at the light source. For flat areas like weapon blades and plate armor, we want to get into the habit of painting the half that's facing away from the light source, since that's how light pools on flat surfaces. For cylinders, we want to make straight lines along the surface of the cylinder pointing towards the light source. This is also a nice time to practice extending out lines to make them mostly straight. And for edges and textures, just picking out which points need some light and which ones don't. Finding out what feels like too much and where's a good cutoff point. This is also a really good time to figure out how detailed we can get. Try and make the thinnest lines we can and the smallest dots. They may not be the smallest ever to start, but by knowing our limits we can set expectations for ourselves that aren't based on what other painters can do, but what we can. Then when I have a sense of what I'm going for and how it looks, if I did too much or too little, out comes the second thin coat and no one's the wiser. Okay, this one's bordering on the silly a bit, but hear me out. As miniature painters, we use acrylic, waterproof when dry. But what if there was a paint that was high quality and had a heavy pigment load, but could be washed off easily with some water? Well, that's actually a thing. Gouache is a pigment dense watercolor using gum arabic as the binder, which is water soluble. It's super matte when dry, which is why there's a lot of acrylic gouache paint lines, which are acrylics, but trying to mimic the effect of a normal gouache. But that dries waterproof. However, if we just use a normal gouache, the water soluble kind, then we can do whatever we want to a miniature and just wash it off. A small set like this, though this isn't a high quality one, can be relatively cheap and would be good for just learning how to mix colors. Want to know how to make a bone from scratch, but don't want to waste the good stuff doing it? Gouache uses all the same pigments as acrylics do, so we'll give similar results when just trying things out. Let's say we're not sure on a color scheme. Do we want to do green cloth or crimson cloth? By using gouache over an acrylic, we can paint in a test with the gouache to compare on the model. We can even do a bit of layering over gouache as long as we don't get the paint too wet though it will pick up the underlayer a bit even if it's not too wet unless you have a really high quality gouache. But we can practice layering with it either over gouache or acrylic. Lastly, if we want to practice edge highlighting but don't want anything permanent, use the gouache instead to get the lining and see how it looks with our current colors and skills. Though this is definitely best done over an acrylic base as I had trouble with it pulling up the other layers. Using gouache though will allow us to easily clean up mistakes as we go if over an acrylic. If you painted your heart out and you actually like the final look of the model you painted in gouache and want to keep it, then using a light sealant to bind those pigments to the model means your work becomes slightly more permanent again, though still not as secure as an acrylic, which you'll see in a second. Because the biggest difference between gouache and acrylic is that at the end, when we're done with all our experimenting, we can go from a complete model to an unfinished one in an instant. Though you can see the side we protected doesn't come off in the same way. So you should be good enough for display or gaming if you do a few layers of that sealant, but it's not perfect. I'm not really a motivational speaker or the motivational type, so I'm not going to pretend I know the answer that'll get you motivated to finally get started on your painting journey. But it is the new year, and I want to start it on a good note. So my final tip is for the perfectionists among us worried that if you can't achieve a 100% perfect model with your current skill, that it's not worth trying. Perfect one thing, just one thing on a model. It can be any one thing get really good at leather, or color scheme selection, or techniques like stippling or dry brushing, then just finish the rest as best you can. As long as you have one thing you're working on to perfect, then eventually you'll have done something perfect and can move on to perfecting the rest. Please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this one or just other fun things to do with painting miniatures. And until next time, enjoy your own painting journey.